This video will attempt to cover all of the electricity side of module one of the AQA Physics A A-level syllabus. Anything from the formula sheet will be in green. So anything in green you know you will be given in the formula sheet. To start off with electricity, we need to understand that electricity is all to do with charge. Now, charge is a property of certain particles. As you know from the particle side of the course, we give it the symbol Q and it has the unit of Coulomb, symbol capital C. And charge is really important because all electricity is, is a movement of charge. And so we define our electric current, we give it the symbol I, it has units of ampere, symbol capital A, and we define current as the rate of flow of charge. So it's the change in charge divided by the change in time, i.e. how much charge is passing a given point in a second. So that's our definition of current. To get a current to flow, we need to give it a push. There needs to be a potential difference. Now, a potential difference is to do with a, a, a difference in potential energy between one point and another, such that the electrons will want to flow. We can also call that voltage. It has a symbol V and is measured in volts. And the definition of potential difference is the work done per unit charge. So how much energy does each coulomb of charge have? And that could be the work done by a battery or it could be the work done um, in a component in a circuit. Those two things, potential difference and current, come together when we look at resistance. Resistance is the opposition to a flow of electrical current. It has symbol R and the unit of ohms. Now resistance is defined from Ohm's law. Ohm's law is a really important equation and it says that R is equal to V over I. That is to say that V and I are in direct proportion. V equals IR and their constant of proportionality is the resistance. You'll see from that equation that if you increase the potential difference, you get a bigger current. If you decrease the resistance, you get a bigger current. From this, we can draw certain graphs. We draw IV graphs, current voltage, or potential different graphs. And these IV graphs are really, really important because they tell us a lot about a component. You'll notice straight away that the gradient I over V is the inverse of the resistance. So first of all, if you have something ohmic, that is something that obeys Ohm's law, such as a resistor, you will end up with direct proportion, a perfect straight line through the origin. You can work out the gradient, and one over the gradient would give you the resistance. So a steep gradient would be a low resistance, and a shallow gradient would be a high resistance. We could also see how the resistance of something changes, and so something non-ohmic, such as a filament lamp, will draw this kind of S-shaped curve. What's happening in this filament lamp? There's a middle section that's roughly ohmic. As I increase the potential difference, the current increases. But as the current increases, all of those electrons bombard the uh, ionic lattice, and so those ions gain more energy, so they move around more. Because they're moving around more, they're more likely to impact the electrons trying to flow through, and that is seen as more resistance. And so you can see this gradient shallows out. The resistance increases at high voltages, because they have high currents and thus a high temperature. So that's a filament lamp. Really interesting because it shows how the temperature affects the resistance of a component. We also have some slightly less normal components, such as a diode made of a semiconductor. And it will not allow a current through in reverse. It has an almost infinite resistance if you wire it backwards. But then forwards, it has a very low resistance, and you'll find that there's a certain cutoff point of 0.6 volts, where suddenly this semiconductor diode becomes very, very conducting really important to know those IV graphs for different components. But this idea of resistance, we, we've talked about how temperature affects it, but it's also affected by the physical properties of a wire. If I want to know about the resistance R of a wire, I can say that it's going to be proportional to the length. A longer wire is harder to get through, but inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area, because a wider wire is easier to get through, and I also have to have another property, depending on what my wire is made of. And that other property we call resistivity. Resistivity has units of ohm meters, and it is a property of a material. Whilst length and cross-sectional area are properties of a specific wire, 
resistivity is a property of a material. And the formula that you get on the formula sheet is just a rearrangement of that, which is that rho, the resistivity, is equal to R A over L. Now, having looked at, at resistances and currents and potential differences, we're ready to start building circuits. But at this point, we need a power supply. And a power supply such as a battery will have what we call an EMF. Now, EMF stands for electromotive force, which is a stupid name because it's entirely wrong, but we'll stick with EMF. It's defined as the energy supplied per unit charge. Energy per unit charge, that's exactly the same as potential difference. And the EMF of something is the work done per unit charge by the power supply. It's how much energy does that battery give to every unit of charge. The interesting thing is that the answer isn't the same as the PD that you actually see across the circuit. Your formula sheet gives you this equation. It's basically Ohm's law. V equals IR. It's just that in this case, we have to take into account the total resistance. That's the resistance of the circuit plus the internal resistance, the resistance inside the battery that you have to overcome. Now, I can multiply out those brackets and rearrange the equation a little bit, and I can see that the terminal voltage, V, that's the voltage across the terminals of the battery or the cell, that's the potential difference that I actually experience for the circuit, that is equal to the EMF minus I little r. That is to say, IR, from Ohm's law, we can say V equals IR, the potential difference dropped across the internal resistance, that's lost. My EMF of the battery might be 9 volts, but if I lose 1 volt across the internal resistance, my circuit will only ever see 8 volts of that. And that's really important. But the good news is that it only ever comes up in questions about internal resistance in EMF. Most of the work that you do, you will see the joyous words, negligible internal resistance. And that tells you, you can ignore this part of the syllabus because the potential difference you get in the circuit will be exactly equal to the EMF. And that is really, really helpful. When that's the case, we can do some far more complex equations with the two main types of circuit, series and parallel. So let's have a look at series and parallel circuits. They have different rules. In a series circuit, the current is the same everywhere. There's nowhere for it to split. It just goes around one path. And that is really useful to know. The potential difference, however, is shared. And it is shared in the ratio of the resistances of components. So I have two resistors in series. One of them is twice as big. It gets two thirds of the voltage. The one that's only half as big, it gets one third of the voltage. So the potential difference is shared in the ratio of their resistances. The total resistance in series is really simple. You just add the resistances together. I have a 5 ohm resistor and a 6 ohm resistor. In series, their total resistance is just 11 ohms. Nice and straightforward. Now, in a parallel circuit, the rules reverse. The current doesn't stay the same, but the current splits. When I get to a junction, some electrons flow one way, some electrons flow the other. And they will be shared in the inverse ratio of the resistances. If I have a pathway that's got twice the resistance, it will only get half as much current as the easier route, which makes perfect sense. The potential difference, however, is the same across each branch. And that's really useful, especially when it comes to some of the more complex calculations. To combine resistors in parallel, it's 1 over the total resistance is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, and so on if you have even more. Really easy equation to use, but be very careful that once you've worked out what 1 over RT is, you do flip it, take the inverse to actually find the total resistance. Now that we've actually got circuits that we can build and use, we can start to find applications for them. So for example, this sharing of potential difference in a series circuit, that lets you build a potential divider. I have a 9 volt battery, but I only want 6 volts, so I can set up two resistors that share out the potential difference, so one has 6 volts across it. I divide the potential difference, so I get what I want out. I can also put in components such as light-dependent resistors, LDRs or thermistors, that change their resistance dependent on their physical conditions, and the potential divider gives me an output voltage that depends on what I have going on in terms of temperature or light intensity. 
Now, this leads us to one of the final sections we have to think about with these circuits, which is the idea of power. Obviously, electricity is a type of energy, and so we need to know how much energy is transferred per second. The amount of energy transferred per second is power. We measure it in watts, capital W. And thankfully, for electrical power, there's one equation. That's that power is equal to voltage times current. But sometimes we don't know the voltage or the current, and so we can substitute in from Ohm's law, and we get I squared R and V squared over R. And all of those are equal to electrical power. This central one, P equals I squared R, is really, really useful. You'll use it an awful lot when you are calculating um, particularly the energy given out as heat per second. Be aware that power may well be described as energy transferred or energy dissipated per second, or the rate of energy dissipation. They all mean the same thing. Power, how much energy per second. That's DC done, all of the direct current, which leads us onto AC. Now, before we talk about AC, you need to understand an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope is just a real-time graph. It has two axes, and it has a spot that travels on these axes, and the bits that it touches glow. So first of all, the dot will move from side to side at whatever time you tell it to. So it has a time base. The x-axis is time. You can determine what each square on the oscilloscope screen is worth. So at the moment, I'll say that each square is worth 10 milliseconds. On the y-axis, uh, we have the voltage. So we'll sometimes talk about the voltage sensitivity or the y-sensitivity or the voltage gain, and that's basically saying the same thing as the time base. What's each square worth vertically? So let's imagine for a moment that each square is worth one volt. If I had a DC signal, it would just be a horizontal line as long as the time base was switched on, and the dot would just go across and across and across. And in that case, that would be a DC of two volts. AC changes direction. The current alternates forwards and backwards. And it does this in the shape of a sine curve. So I'd have a bit of practice drawing them if I were you. So a sine curve such as that, and you can see that this goes up to a maximum of one volt and down to a minimum of a minus one volt. And that sinusoidal shape is what an AC one volt supply would look like. Now, you do need to be able to measure a couple of things there. You need to be able to measure the peak-to-peak -peak voltage, which is from there to there, and just the peak voltage, which is from the middle up to the highest point. Those are really important. The main reason they're important is that we can't compare AC and DC directly. We can't say, I've got one volt DC, and that's the same as one volt AC, because they're not the same. In AC, the current is constantly changing. To compare, we need to use something called the RMS. So the RMS voltage, which stands for root mean squared, the RMS voltage is defined as a DC voltage that would give the same heating effect as an AC voltage. So if I take my AC voltage, V naught, that's a peak voltage, not peak to peak, just a peak voltage, and I divide it by root 2, that gives me the VRMS, the equivalent DC value. So I might have a certain value of AC voltage divided by root 2, and that will tell me that actually that's equivalent to a slightly lower DC value. And the good news is that that works exactly the same for current, and I just substitute in I note the peak current, divide that by root 2, and that gives me the IRMS value. 